Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's talk, sponsored by the Central Asia Working Group under the auspices of the Institute of East Asian Studies at UC Berkeley. This is an initiative that aims to bring Eurasia into focus by fostering campus-wide dialogue between faculty, visiting scholars, and graduate students working on the region. Before introducing the speaker, I just want to say that you can type in your questions by clicking the Q&A tab. I will try and get to as many as, of them as possible at the end of the talk. For any technical issues, please use the chat tab at the bottom of your screen. Our speaker today, Yufei Li, is a PhD candidate in architecture at the University of Cambridge. Her research focuses on urban placemaking and historic heritage, particularly within the East Asian context. Her recent projects, Cinematic Choreography, Remapping the Narrative Industrial Landscape of Northeast China, and Atlas in Motion, Visualizing Manchuria, attend to the shifting cultural landscapes of modern Northeast China to uncover the identity of place in its narrative geographies through films. Professionally, you face an ARB registered, registered architect and a RIBA chartered member. She has practiced architectural design in London and specialized in the renovation and restoration of cultural venues. She holds an AA diploma from the Architectural Association and an MPhil with distinction in architecture and urban studies from the University of Cambridge. Today, her talk would be on visualizations of Manchuria through films produced in the 1930s and 1940s in the light of its contemporary urban cultural regeneration. Please join me in welcoming Yu Fei Li. Hi, thank you, Frank, for your warm welcome and your invitation for me to join the working group. And yeah, I would like to share my screen first. Uh, thanks for your welcome and your introduction. And it's my great pleasure to join you both in and share my current research about the distant place, both in space and time, that is Manchuria. As I am from an architectural background with a speciality related to cinematic architecture and urban placemaking, I attempt to outline an image of Manchuria's past urban spaces and everydayness through the image of film. Still, as the research gets along, it cuts through many inter interdisciplinary interests. So I look forward to receive valuable feedbacks from a wide range of audience today. About the brief structure of today's talk, I will start with the broad context of Manchuria, zoom into its hard colonial urban development that associated with the media images in its modern history. This then brings out my methodology and research scope to the project and my specific focus for the images of place in Manchuria films. I will finish off with my attempt of doing remote field works and the travel restrictions due to the still ongoing global pandemic. So Manchuria is a historical term of a region corresponding roughly to the current three provinces of Northeast China with a part of, with a part of in East Inner Mongolia. The region located outside of the eastmost gate of the Great Wall had many names as Liao Xin in history. The term Manchuria was mostly recognized after the Manchu people conquered the inland China and ruled China throughout the Qing Dynasty from the 17th century to the beginning of 20th century. Historically, the place was often called Guan Wai in Chinese, means outside the gate of the Great Wall. The local inhabitants came from various racial groups such as Han, Manchus, Mongols, Koreans, and many more nomad clans. The region was the royal origin of the Manchus during Qing Dynasty. It was fenced by the Qing authorities with willow palisade, almost as a soft extension to the Great Wall to prevent uh, immigrant access and and the prohibition policy lasted for 200 years. 
The North border conflict between Qing and Russia in mid 19th century urged the Qing rulers to abolish the restrictions and instead reinforcing the northeastern border by bringing in migratory settlements. The nomads settled as natives and the immigrants became the new locals. The concept of local Manchuria was constantly redefined through the restless movements of people across the broad landscape. Manchuria as a place name that started to get recognized from foreigners first appeared in the writings of Japanese scholars. The term was first used in this offline map of Japan and its neighboring regions. Previously, the West used the term Chinese Tartary to address Manchuria and Mongolia regions. It was not until the late 19th century that the significance of Manchuria as a place was being highlighted internationally due to Russia and Japan's scramble for the territory. The modernization of Manchuria was almost a byproduct of the wars. At the beginning of the 20th century, with the decline of the Qing government, Japan and Russia fought in Manchuria to plant the resources and land. This animated map I made could probably give you a sense of the chaos before 1945. After the first Sino-Japanese War and following the Russo-Japanese War, powers of Qing, Russia, Japan, and the local warlords intertwined upon the land of Manchuria. Japan and Russia built and controlled the main railway network in Northeast China and occupied the areas connected to the stations as extraterritorial zones or fushu di in Chinese. In these half colonies emerged the prototypes of modern cities. So afterwards, in 1931, Japan launched the Manchuria incident, took full control of the northeastern provinces and established a country called Manchukuo. From 1931 to 1945, Manchuria, as the base of Japan's invasion to the mainland China, carried their ambitions and dreams. Operating under the Russian and Japanese governments, respectively, respectively the, the Chinese Eastern Railway Company, CER, of Russia, and the South Manchuria Railway Company, SMR, of Japan, became the key institutes to execute foreign colonial powers in Manchuria. Over time and in the process of empire building, the railways not only connected the settlements and facilitated exploitation of resources, but also reshaped the physical and cultural geography of Manchuria. Simultaneous to the constructions, Cultural transmissions were slowly developing along with the establishing infrastructures and city chain. Film, as a relatively new and publicly accessible visual material of the time, emerged as one of the earliest imported cultural products in Manchuria during the first decade of the 20th century. Film screening was introduced into Manchuria from the south and the north almost simultaneously, by the Japanese in Dalian and by the Russians in Harbin, and then extended to major cities in Manchuria, such as Mokden and Changchun along the railway lines. The filmmaking activities were again initiated southmost in Dalian and northmost in Harbin, both as the result of military instructions to capture the Russo-Japanese War during the 1904 and 1905 by reporters from Reuters and Russia. However, it took the Japanese another 20 years to match these Western competitors by recording their first image of Manchuria on celluloid. The photographic department of the SIR, South Manchuria Railway Company, began to shoot separate movie scenes in 1926, documenting both the human activities and the natural landscapes of Manchuria. 
The target audience of these early SNR films was the Japanese and other spectators abroad with the production valuing its political functions or commercial success. Following the Mokden incident of 1931 and founding of Manchukuo in 1932, the Imperial Japan regarded Manchuria as the continental base of the Great East Asia co-prosperity sphere, sphere. Meanwhile, they also saw the building of Manchukuo as a solution to their enduring problems rooted in their home islands. Riki Seno, the president of the Institute of Japanese Architects in the 1930s, once mentioned Waga Manchukuo or Manchukuo in a meeting with his fellow architects. To elaborate on his use of the phrase, Seno explained Japan's great affection for Manchukuo with its expensive and rich resources that would boost their homeland's strength. The Japanese launched a building project of unprecedented scale to build a new nation. Manchuria was regarded as a spacious canvas, a laboratory in every aspect, just the same size as Japan. The formation of the puppet state other than its physical planning and construction. It's also incorporated the architecture of the soft cultural image, which aimed to unify the identity and solidarity of the state. This was expressed in the national slogans, such as Paradise of the Kindly Way and Racial Harmony. At the foundation of this dreamland construction, it was crucial for the Japanese to craft a strong ideology to rationalize their actions in building a foreign land, an ideology that necessitated the Japanese role as a developer, even a savior over Manchuria. In their early narratives, Manchuria was a deserted no man's land, but with heavy investment by the Japanese, both physically and emotionally, its rich soil would wrap for development. Such image set the tone of Manchuria on official propaganda brochures, postcards, travelogues, and film screen. Two particular types of propaganda have drawn my attention in their stunning similarities between each other in the methods of place representation. One is Manchuria, other is Manchuria. Manchuria and, Man and the Japanese occupation has a long established culture of tourism originating from its infrastructural nature in the process of modernization and the connectivity of the railway networks. The methods of tourism promotion followed a rather formalized systematic method over the years, extracting the fragments of landscape features from delicate visual representations them together through the threads of the real lines, thus presenting a seemingly reliable and pleasant image of the journey. However, those who made the real trip to Manchuria may, may have encountered a tougher reality outside the polished viewports, such as that experienced by Peter Fleming, a Times correspondent written in his book, One's Company, in 1933. One would perceive the peacefulness and prosperity of the area by blind, blindly following the official rules. But the time deviation from the track would lead to unexpected scenes of roughness, readiness, and the struggles of the local Manchurians' daily lives. As an alternative, the medium of film gradually draw the authorities' attention to propagating similar cultural tourism of the region through an edited version, thus connecting all the desirable scenery in a photorealistic narrative idealism while omitting the darker side of the real. 
filmmaking and screening in Manchuria were never purely artistic or commercial in both of its intention and practice. Instead, they were made in favor of the national, national propaganda. After 1932, the governments of Manchugo began to appreciate the reality images as part of their social and cultural programs. Amid the overwhelming responsibilities of the SMR, its former photographic department was transformed to a joint venture by SMR and Manchuko government, took over control of film productions and distributions in the country in its new name of Manchuria Film Association, Main in Shop. Main films were produced under three categories, Enlightenment movie, current affairs movie, and entertainment movie that account for education and fiction films respect, respectively. This visual propaganda of Manchuria finally embraced into the final grids of the cultural geography. Cinema took viewers on a world rooted in the millions of Manchuria that mingled with realities and fabrications. Foregrounding the cultural geographies, contextual account and cinematic studies, the research aimed to pick an image of Manchuria as a place through mapping the cinematic geographies. Cinematic mapping as a methodological approach attracts increasing attention of interdisciplinary researchers in cultural, media, and urban studies. Its applications range from archiving the real world in films to untangling the filmic narrative spaces to layering the cinematic portraits of the city. The image of a region as in intricate as Manchuria in this case is a large composite of subdivided places, each constituting a facet of the whole picture. Taking the nature of atlas as both a form of representation and an analytical instrument. The research is not only to relocate a visual catalog of historical landscape, but also to retrieve a collect collective culture and sensual experience of the region during the particular period of time. Neither map or film is attempting to achieve achieve a literal recreation of reality. Such representations are expected to inherit an analog analogous structure to the territory and the interrelations between people and place in its cultural geography. Visualizing a place through cinema involves a series of changing perspectives. Instead of a linear tree, the route through the cinematic geographies is multi-directional in a constant process of cross-referencing among the three columns, film as a cultural product, the cinematic landscape, and the making of place. The major challenge in data collection is to locate available historical materials, which include the Manchuria films as the main source of investigation and the contextual literature of cinema industry, referencing materials such as historical maps, postcards, and photos. In the past two years, the ongoing pandemic situation restricted me from visiting archives in China or Japan. Luckily, a large bundle of Manchuria films are made accessible in forms of commercial videotapes and DVDs during 1990s and 2005. Many of them are available in the university library, and some from antique bookshop online. So I was able to slowly building up the collection. Imagine if we take a train trip to Manchuria in the past, we could encounter most of the cities through the lens of film, 
as what I have mapped here using the archived resources. Among the secondary sources of representation, film exhibits the dynamic landscape of material through its direct impressions created by moving images. Bruno argues that narrative cinema is a form of modern cartography, constituting a haptic way of sightseeing that connects the pictures into a cinematic landscape. Film assembles individual frames into a linear narrative, capturing a simulated landscape shot by shot. Even though most of the material films were criticized for their propaganda quality at the time of their production, their present value is that of a lively archive that shows the visual landscape and society of the region, enabling us to revisit the place then and now. As British filmmaker Patrick Killer said, moving images offer us a number of possibilities to architecture in representing spaces that do not yet exist or as a model for new architecture and architectural theory. But as the medium ages, one wonders if perhaps it offers both as an approach to experiencing the spaces of other times. End of quote. One of the major contributions of historical Manchurian film to our current depiction of this image is that the places being represented on screen are highly identifiable in their physical locations. Manchurian films both, both documentaries and fiction had the exterior scenes shot on site. These sites were deliberately selected to serve the relevant storylines in advocating material, emphasizing a convincing narrative that occurred here in Manchuria to convey a greater impression of realism. Upon examining the re research footages, Images of place captured in Manchuria films generally fall into the three different categories. The well-developed modern metropolis, places of significant cultural interest, and people's everyday commonplaces. European style boulevards, public squares, grand architecture, and monumental memorials Footages of the advanced metropolis in the early 20th century constitute a significant quarter to the policy-based Manchukuo propaganda scheme, symbolizing a highly modernized newborn state. Its city center depictions filmed with an authoritative perspective, how to exhibit the top-down urban planning and construction put into effort by the Manchukuo government. In terms of the screen language, aerial views and real pan views are frequently adopted in filming to exaggerate the magnificent scales of the planning overview and spectacular building forms. These perspectives are artificially constructed in contrast to the natural human sites. The aerial views from the high vantage point in particular emphasize a sense of domination and control over the territory. It has been applied most frequently to film Xinjiang, the new capital of Manchukuo. The great Xinjiang urban planning was designed by the Japanese urban planners with influences from the Beaux-Arts and reference to the urban regeneration in 19th century Paris and the Garden City's concept, concept in England. It was a carefully designed plan near large scale, too large for the Japanese to finish before 1945. However, the construction of Xinjiang has been a recurring subject on the Manchuria film screen. 
on the plan in the ni- 1932 and the map in 1937, Sinjing unveiled an integrated urban pattern of diagonal boulevards with rectangular grids as a combination of influences from Western planning theories and Chinese urban grid traditions. Similar patterns were also applied in the new town, the Japanese extraterritorial zone in Mongden. The Japanese planning design followed the Russian European precedents and many built upon the urban pattern left by the Russians. Beginning with the Russian implementation of the European move for its early planning strategy of their affiliated railway zones. The modern plans of Manchuria often exhibited a Baroque style in line with the famous medieval space concept of the time. The earliest design of Dalian in 1899 were carefully crafted by planners imported from Russia and Germany. Ten streets radiated from Nicholas Square with urban grids arranged along the diagonals. Grand public squares with its radiated avenues became the main streetscape shown in footages of these large material cities. In this short collection, first there is the central square in Mongden. Then is the central square in Dalian. And finally, the Datong Square in Xinjiang. The main streets in Xinjiang are extremely wide with the train lines and the green open spaces in reference to the boulevards in Paris. Interestingly, after the Meiji Restoration of 1868, the trend of westernization flourished in Japan, being the main reason behind the overall European style assimilated into many Japanese orientated buildings in Manchuria. Design in an Asian adopted Victorian, Baroque or neoclassical style, these majestic and glamorous buildings are displayed at the window of these upper class newcomers and foreign visitors. The architecture in Xinjiang, however, is an alternative example. In constructing the official buildings for the new capital, Japanese architects came out with a mixed style to top the neoclassical buildings with Chinese style roofs in order to achieve a unique identity of Manchuria. The idealism was to show a world-class modern state with Asian cultural identity in the new Xinya style. However, even back at the time, it was widely criticized, especially among the Japanese architects. Regardless of the rumors, the film advancing into capital were proudly showing each of the individual Xinya buildings as the symbolized Manchurian identity in physical forms. Moving to a cultural focus among Manchurian films, a significant proportion of non-fiction footages attempt to address the cultural uniqueness and complexity of the Manchuria region. These films adopted an explorative, explorative view in filming places of cultural interest, which depict its historical architectural heritage, ethnic groups, religious events, and some indigenous practice and lifestyles. The Lama Temple in Jeho region is one of the most famous places of historic cultural heritage in Manchuria films. The Anchodan Jeho, made by the SIR in the 1936, 
captures the temples elegantly and portrayed the beautiful castles. It was well received during its release in Japan and ranked top 10 best Japanese films of the year. The Japanese had put significant efforts in surveying the temple court and palace, palace, which was once the royal resort of Qing emperors. Attempted restoration work were also carried out in the region, with the progress again captured in the Concordia Newsreel Report number seven. Curiously, part of the documentary footage was reused in the Mayim fiction film, Song of White Orchid, in 1939, without a clear link to its main narrative, but just to enrich the element of realism with scenes of feature, featured Manchurian landscapes. To fulfill the advocating role of visual harmony, Manchuria films also attempt to capture the various ethnic cultures, the stunning and endless stretching grassland, the yachts and the Mongols, best represent the Mongolian nomad life in films such as the grass, grassland and the footage of the grassland in the Gurgenmiao and the day of Manchu, Mongolian sumo and market fair in St. Town reported in the Concordia Man in Newsreel number two. Besides the above, another newsreel, the Grand Grassland in late autumn, Fanjur Fair, also recalls the activity of Mongolian sumo, but it appeared to be a pre-arranged setting. The event was joined by the Japanese film crew and official visitors. A special event was held to have the Japanese sumo fighting with Man Mongolian sumo in the local culture event. The arrangement of documentary narratives serves the bureaucratic purpose of reaching the racial harmony. Some other films were produced with cultural curiosity primarily Examples include the Niang Niang Temple Fair, filmed in Da Shiqiao, and the Ice Baptism, filmed in Harbin. Such cultural and religious events usually happen during the specific period each year, with ceremony stages, fairs, and markets constructed in designated places. The Niang Niang Temple Fair was one of Manchuria's most famous local religious events, with established tradition since early Qing. Mijin Mountain, where the temple is located, was crowded with visitors, booths, costume, racial, and folk performance, as seen in the film. A place of social, economic, and cultural exchange is recorded in the documentary that possesses both introductory values to its viewers and archival values of the regional culture. The cinematography mastered the zoom of camera to show the event's spatial quality to different scales in depth. The cam camera zoomed in three times from a long shot at the foot of the mountain to a close-up towards the temple on its top. In another five stage zooming in, the moving image lead our eyes to the central stage where the opera is on air. And 
close shot of the foods, artifacts, and activity booths in the big temple there, I think gave us valuable archival resources for the indigenous event. Among Manchuria films, there are also a group of footages that were shot with the foreign base of anti-minority. Some local practices were unique to the specific site and seasonal conditions, especially with the extreme coldness of the Nazis. The SMR produced an enlightenment film, The Appearance of Ice, to elaborate the freezing winter and the impact on people's life during the winter period, which lasts for almost four months in North Manchuria. In the film, locals were captured in these ice charts as a transport method over the frozen river. Winter activities such as ice fishing were also reported in newsreel footages. Other activities unique to the specific site, including fishing with cormorants and tiger hunting in East Manchuria. There were new lifestyles to the Japanese who would obtain as much local knowledge as possible to adapt into the new continent. The colonial metropolis on screen are interspersed with ordinary clips of urban life. In contrast with the large scale buildings, the urban living environment is established in both long shots of the hustle and bustle streets and the close framings of the food, commercial products, and everyday household activities. In general, commercial streets, local neighborhoods, are the typical everyday landscapes favored in the material film depictions. The high streets in their film images take distinctive forms according to different residential and cultural groups. Targeting international immigrants from Japan and Russia, the visual forms of the modern developed towns featured the respective exotic costumes. Pictorial replicas of commercial streets in Japan and Russia became common practice in shaping the image of the modern Manchuria landscapes. Among them, modern Japanese high streets are the ones filmed with more advocating intentions. Both Japanese orient oriented commercial streets in Mogen and Dalian were named Naniwa, which is the old name of Osaka. The scenes display the transplantation of economic and cultural life from Japan to Manchuria cities. Thus constitute a sense of familiarity and confidence for the Japanese new immigrants. Comparing to the Japanese high street, local Chinese commercial streets and Russian style high streets appeared much less for political propaganda purpose, as they were already there before the founding of the Manchuria. The footages are usually associated with cultural tourism and settings in fiction films to show the cultural varieties of the Manchuria region. The sense of neighborhoods generally varies between Japanese residential areas and the local Chinese residential areas, with the former being a part of the state constructions. The cultural housing pictured in footages of Xinjiang was a popular Japanese Western combination, originated from Japan in the 1920s. In the propaganda footage of Xinjiang, the cultural housing is trying to convey, convey an upper middle class image with low density housing scheme, dog walking, tennis courts, and garden for afternoon tea, carefully constructed as a polished advertisement to fit the desirable lifestyle in Japan. 
compared to the cultural housing dormitories for Japanese employees. In this case, the multi-story apartment buildings were built with simplicity, equipped with modern household facilities. The apartments were allocated to those who came to work in Manchuria for companies such as the SMR. In the film, the woman, the Japanese woman's father is a boss of a Japanese architectural office in Manchuria. So their family lives within the district. Local Chinese alleys or Hu Tong are single story buildings, traditional local houses lined up along a small road at the back of the main street. In the screenshot of Ying Chunhua, the Hu Tongs are generally unpaved roads. The walls are lack of repair and the roofs are overgrown with weeds. In the film made in 1942, the main male character Murakawa expresses his interest in moving to the Chinese neighborhood, which of course shocked his Japanese cousin. The different living conditions and the attitudes towards the different neighborhoods underline the problem of urban zoning and segregation within the big Manchurian cities even in such propaganda films. The uneven of power and hierarchy is also implicitly shown in the city's service sectors. Most of the carriers, rickshaw pullers, and construction workers, miners in other footages are being Chinese. The everyday life, which was to be modern and polished, was built upon these neighboring services. Following the above overview of the cinematic places in Manchuria, the case study is an initial attempt to apply the hybrid analytical framework in outlining the image of Siping Street, a famous commercial district in Mongden, through a one-minute scene in Ying Chunhua. The main character, Murakawa, just moved from Japan to work in Mongden, the central city of Manchuria. In order to better understand the local society, he decided to rent a house in a Chinese neighborhood. He was drifting along traditional alleys and streets, walking past the local markets and retail fronts. After a while, he met Bai Li, a local Manchurian woman. So that's the one minute film. Composing an atlas of the place from moving images involves a process of close reading, which integrates all observations, interpretation, and emotional factions in order to define the three essential elements, location, locale, and sense of place. In the process of mapping the place, we need to identify the location first. In the 1940s, Mokden was divided into three parts. The yellow part is the wolf tongue and is the old Manchurian tongue. The red part is the railway zone and the Japanese is extraterritorial area. The green part is the Shangfu Li the business room set by warlords. Murakawa's intention to live a local life indicated his destination was most likely in the inner work town. And he was wandering on a local commercial street, 
the area around Siping Strait would be his perfect destination. The local high street is located in the walled town, linking the small east gate to the small west gate of the city wall. As one of the oldest and most famous commercial street in the area, Siping Street appeared in many brochures and postcards. Cross-examining elements in the scene with other historical records in the walled town area, we can identify the spots appeared in the film, such to map out the fragmented trajectory of Murakawa's tour. He visited several alleys, hutongs, before coming to the most flourishing section of Siping Street with multi-story mall buildings. He wandered around the south of the street where the stationery and painting stores were located. In the, in the next shot, he appeared around the small east gate where the food markets located close by. Finally, he walked along the outer town wall of the small west gate and meet Miss Bai Li. I refer to the method of modernology used by Japanese architect Mojiro Kong and Yoshida Kankichi in the 1930s to draw over the film scenes and extracted urban data from the cinematic images in the aspects of topography, artifact, and character. A symphony of old and new unfolds in the topography and buildings. The local Manchurian townscape is categorized, uh, characterized by the single-story houses with Chinese sloping roofs in the Xuanshan and Yingshan styles arranged along the narrow alleys. Meanwhile, a pastiche of European architecture known as Yangfeng commonly appears on the main street in the form of multi-story terraced facades trimmed with vertical columns and plaster architraves. Elements of modernization, such as the electric lighting and utility pools in Old Town are associated with Western cultural imports. The numerous details of the retail establishment and artifacts on the screen further immerse the viewers in the street space. Retailers hung their banners and decorations out beneath the telegraphic shop signs, advertising restaurants, brushes and ink and picture mounting services. Open booths sit outside of the timber shop fronts along the street, either as extensions of the retail spaces or meant by people selling farm products. Around the corner of the street, a glazed window displays golf posters, implying an international advancement even in the traditional shopping street. In terms of the characters, some local street sellers are wearing Ushanka hats, which are originated from Russia. A man was selling Tanghulu, a local candied food snack during, during winter. Murakawa is in a dressing coat completely westernized as fedora and long coat, whereas Bai Li, although modern enough, is wearing a hand warmer that was a special product of the region. Ying Chunhua tends to mask his advocacy of imperial propaganda through indirect approaches. Murakawa plays the role of witness to this success in Mongden and the Japanese roof. It leads the viewers to sense the richness of Manchurian daily life through the bustling crowds, mixed cultural displays, and abundant food supply. He also appears as an ambassador, bridging the Japanese and the Manchurians by showing the will to emerge himself into the local cultures. 
rarely seen in the fiction films. The exterior scenes in Ying Chunhua were mostly shot by mixing the actor into the real crowds. The passersby on the street played themselves, sometimes looking at the camera curiously, like this guy in the golf shop. The less organized production on location validates the reliability of the street views to a certain extent. On one location, the filming seems to be pre-organized and instructed. The butcher was showing Murakawa a cluster of meat. The pork heads on market booths are seasonal special for Chinese New Year, indicating the scene was filmed near the New Year period in the late January or early February. Besides the obvious propaganda purpose, the scene exhibits the hectic nature of film. It gives us an impression of a typical Manchurian winter, which is remarkable for its freezing coldness in approximately minus 20 degrees Celsius. The pork, pheasants, and fish are frozen hard on the market booths. Murakawa's breeze condensed into a white mist. Long shadows sweep up across the street. Cinema archived the moment of Mokden in a winter morning. So I was about to talk about my field work, but then uh, there are not much time left. So I just go through it very simply. My original plan of the field was to, was to go back to China and visit the cities along the old railway lines. But due to the, the current conditions and the restrictions in travel, uh, I have waited for almost nearly two years to, for the field trip and nothing happens. And I haven't got the chance to fly back. So there is, I am carrying out this remote field trip to the cinematic places by asking assistance from my friends and relatives back in China. So I asked them to be my participants and collect the current urban data for me by visiting the places. And I am composing a visitor's booklet for them to travel to the old cinematic places in the current northeastern cities. The purpose to perceive the city and doing the image making in field work is to take in visual records of the tour on the field. It's a reverse process of extracting the cinematic plays from his, the historical films as seen in the cinematic place making framework. From a bottom up perspective, place making is everyone's job for those being members or even only occasionally been in the city environment. Sorry, my computer freeze. <laughs> but yeah, that's about the end of the talk. And I hope you guys have enjoyed it. And if there are any questions, then please feel free to ask me through the Q&A box. Okay, thank you, and I will stop sharing. Uh, thank you very much, Yufeli, for this really fascinating talk. Uh, I've, I've personally been interested in, in Manchuria for a long time, and uh, especially that period. Um, I Before we have all the questions coming in, I, I just wanted to maybe ask you something about the, the term Manchuria. I know it's, um, it's a term that is that has been kind of fraught in terms of usage uh, because of its colonial uh, undertones. Um, um, so I just wanted to know um, your experience using that term um, and, and, and how people respond to that. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to talk about that because there's a problem that I'm always facing after I decided to conduct this research. When you use Manchuria, especially in the Chinese platforms, and 
you will sometimes uh, there are people regard you as uh, the ones advocating the the colonial colonial spirit or the the imperial or uh, imperial Japanese spirit, but actually that's not true. It's only a historic term and to to use to describe the area in the historical background. So, but I think this term is not is a is a sensitive term back in China, but I think doing my research uh, in Cambridge and in the UK is okay to use that. But just uh, when you speak with, speak it in Chinese, you need to speak with cautious. Right, so you get, are you getting any pushback and people kind of asking you to use Dongbei for instance, or <laughs> what do you have to kind of explain first? Uh, why um, is it? Um... I suppose I will explain first before I talk to people. Th those people, I think, may be problematic with the term, even with uh, some of my, my families, because I'm, I'm from the Dongbei area. I'm a North Eastern Chinese. And so uh, there's a mixed emotion when we talk about this topic. And I need to carefully choose my phrasings when addressing the history at that time, because it's not a very pleasant history to some of uh, the local Chinese people. But I think um, to study it, uh, it gives me more perspective to think about and to look at the period of time and to see the possibilities how we address history in different ways and different perspectives. Yeah, no, I understand. You have to to be very sensitive to this this difficult history. Um, a related question I'm gonna kind of ask before the, the questions come in. Um, when I was visiting, when I visited Harbin, um, I was surprised to see how much the Russian heritage was re-commodified for touristic purposes. I'm just wondering whether there's anything similar about the Japanese heritage or whether that's just not possible. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I I was trying to uh, talk about it, but I forgot during my speech. There was a recent event about the Japanese uh, heritage. In, in this case, it's not a heritage, it's an uh, imitation of Japanese cultural street in Dalian. That, uh, this project was initiated by a property company. And the purpose is just to make a commercial street and to sell the residential housing around that commercial street and to make the street a fancy name and a fancy theme, they choose the theme to be a Japanese cultural street. And that caused so many problems <laughs> when they post this online and they open it. So eventually the project was shut and then uh, I don't know what happened to that street, but I think many shops had to close down due to the fact that people don't like this idea. So I think uh, the, the cold now history and heritage uh, in Northeast China is not something people want to advocate or to, or to use as a unique culture. And it's very unlike some of the European colonial heritage in Shanghai or Hong Kong or the Russian heritage in Harbin, which are now very uh, great, welcomed and celebrated and has been making like a signal, a symbolism for the city. But the Japanese heritage, they are just the memorials of the past pains and walls. And there are, there are quite a lot of buildings that are protected historic buildings built by the Japanese, and they are recognized by the government officials. But then uh, it's not uh, a thing that people tend to look at it in a cheerful way or in a positive way. <laughs> right. 
Yeah, it's un- it's understandable. Um, we have a question asking us if there's any precedent for the use of propaganda before the period you're talking about uh, by Imperial Japan. But I, I, I guess that's really kind of linked to the, um, the, the presence of Japan in Manchuria, right? I mean, is there, from before the period you talk about, is there any anything kind of uh, going along those lines? Like, um, was there any kind mm-hmm. of, I mean, maybe, maybe to rephrase, maybe how was, Manchuria kind of imagined maybe by Japan and and propaganda is a, and used maybe in Japan. Do you know? Um, so is the propaganda of Manchuria in Japan? Is it? I I don't. I mean, I'm not sure what the person <laughs> is asking. <laughs> um, but maybe what was the imaginary? Because I think Manchuria was kind of imagined by Japan as a way to uh, kind of re. I mean, re-envision maybe a, a forms of Asia, there would be a forms of modernity and this kind of thing. Do you know how Manchuria was perceived before that? Is there, mm. Was there kind of an imaginary in Japan about Manchuria? I think people just get to know Manchuria after the Japanese come to the area. And in fact, the Japanese come to Manchuria quite early in the 1904 and 1905. And after the rest uh, the Russo Japanese War, they just occupied Dalian. And then that's that also that is also like a starting period for film in general in the world. So I guess they are not earlier since for material before the time. And Japan started to use the film propaganda. Uh, in the 1920s, and that's already included in their advocacy uh, scheme to address Manchuria to their local uh, Japanese residents. And they have also other forms of propaganda cultural products, uh, such as the photos and also uh, wealth, wealth or a uh, professor in Cambridge has written a book about Japanese propaganda in Manchuria. And there are two ways of uh, the propaganda. One is to the heart, the official propaganda, that is through these uh, official films and photos and trips organized. But the other is the soft propaganda, which the Japanese invite uh, people, like the writers, from Japan to visit Manchuria and write their experience and send back to Japan. So it's another way to um, see Manchuria in different eyes. So I guess that's uh, all the ways that they are shaping the Manchuria image image from different methods uh, other than films. Right. Okay, I, I think that probably answers the, the, the question. Um, another question we, we are being asked is, have you ever seen the film representations of the living space and activities for the Chinese imperial family in Manchuria? Um, so the Chinese imperial family, you mean the, like the Manchu families, the Qing families? I, I, I believe so, yes. I would imagine uh, So, yeah. Yeah, there are footages to show uh, Pu Yi, which was the the puppet emperor of the Manchu court. And but they are also made by the, the Japanese. So it's another way of propaganda in this case. And for other non-official footages, I haven't seen much of that. But there are some photographs of uh, those Chinese imperial families back at that time, and yes, they were they have a generally good living condition. I would say, like addressing, like seeing from the images and the way they are living, and Pu Yi himself uh, was having a uh, his um mostly westernized in his clothing and the manner of his uh, speech 
and the activities he was doing. But then uh, it's all, I think it's all controlled images rather than a freely captured ones. Um, in your talk, you, you you mentioned like different areas in the cities, the Chinese areas and Japanese areas. And I was wondering about um, places like Harbin when you had, it was really a multicultural city. You had Russians and also people from everywhere else. Where, do you know where they lived? Would they, did they live in the Japanese area, in the Chinese area or somewhere else? Uh, you, you mean the Russians? Yeah, mm-hmm. Russians and other foreigners. Yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure about that. They have a Russian zone and the Chinese zone in Harbin. Okay. So I know the Chinese people are living in a separate zone further in in the city north. Yeah, there there is a separate zone of, of uh, Chinese residency, and then the central com- commercial streets are more occupied by the. Russian cultures, but I don't know if they have a specific living living district for in the city. And obviously the Japanese didn't capture them in their propaganda films because it's not right. something it's something not related to themselves. Yeah. I generally find that they mm. capture very few images of the Russians and the Chinese uh, in comparison with the Japanese images. <laughs> wow, that's interesting. Yeah, that's very interesting. I, I, yeah, I'm not sure what uh, Russians' representations were, but I think the idea that it was multicultural was uh, kind of a big thing for Harbin. Yeah. yeah. It was yeah, not how- just uh, Russians, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they had both... Actually, the Man Ying made a film of Harbin, uh, a fiction film called uh, My Nightingale. So it is a very interesting film because it's almost a film that made by Japanese, but you can see it as a Russian film. So uh, the characters, uh, they invite Russian actors to, to act as characters in the film. And one Japanese uh, woman as the main character, but she also speaks Russian fluently. And they were there as a group of ac- actors and actresses, and they perform on stage with Russian operas. So the whole film uh, feels like a foreign film, but it's made by the Japanese filming group. So that was uh, uh, quite interesting finding while I was watching those materials. Yeah, because I think that maybe the Russians and the Japanese in different ways, they kind of shared an imaginary of Manchuria as kind of this utopian place where you could reimagine the nation. Yeah, and Uh, they were trying to impose their own imaginations into the land by Mm -hmm. building similar things from and moving similar uh, things from their hometowns to to the right. new land, such as the, right. the buildings and right. the events. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, another question just came in um, about the depiction of Buddhism in Manchukuo, especially the Tibeto Mongolian Buddhism that was prevalent there, and the tension in the Japanese Empire's promotion of Buddhist inflected great harmony on the one hand, including patronage of Buddhist monasteries and secular modernization on the other. So was there uh, this kind of tension between Buddhism and modernism that you you saw in the films and the sources you studied? Mm, I think they are not that apparent apparent in the material films and because they mostly, uh, some of them are even uh, no sound in the films and mostly they are showing just the images. So uh, very few opinions expressed through these images. But I guess uh, the link in the, the Tibetan Buddhism uh, is 
is、uh, mainly on the Jeho Jeho temples that the Japanese was putting、uh, quite a lot of effort to restore it, and they were they even built uh, uh I forgot the, if it's the Japanese、uh, effort or the others. That there was a ex world expo in Chicago in 1933, and they built a one-to-one or -one,、uh, Jeho temple in the Chicago at expo. So that was a, a quite huge project, and、mm. yeah, I think that uh that uh Jeho temple re really is a cultural or、uh, important cultural sign. In the Manchuria, that the Japanese want to、uh, exemplify and to show it to the world, I think. Okay, so it sounds like the two were really kind of、uh, portrayed the, the 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 Buddhist aspect, but also the modernist aspect through architecture, modern modernist architecture, right? Yeah, I think they um yeah in the modern aspect uh. I don't know if there are any links in between these two in the films, but then they are trying to、uh, study the traditions of the、uh, Bud Buddhism、uh, architectures and try to restore just、uh, how it was in the tradition and in history. So、um, they are leaving the the cultural、uh, heritage as it is. Uh, despite that, they were putting huge effort on modern developing development on the city regions. I think. Yeah, I think that also brings back to something you said during your talk about the the architecture being a mix of various influences and also including Chinese influence. Is that is that something I got right? Yeah. Is that yeah, so?、Uh, could, Could you tell us a little bit more about that? I mean, what kind of Chinese aspects were they、uh, retaining or including in this、uh, in this architecture? Yeah, I think、uh, that is a、uh, like in in the architects' eyes, in or、uh, especially in the Japanese architects' comments and some Japan or、uh, Chinese architects' comments, they feel the Xinya style, which、uh, the Manchurians. Mm, the Manchurian official buildings they have this、uh, peaked or、uh, roof, and with the westernized base, so it's kind of a superficial combination in, in the comments of the the architects at that time, because they were trying to think of something and come up a solution very quickly to address the.、Uh, The identity of the state of the nation, so they just、uh, put the two things together and to build out this、uh, Xinya style. But then、uh, I think over time it becomes a special type of building. And nowadays,、uh, when we visit Changchun, we see those buildings and we we still feel a historical element in those. Those buildings that are very different from the older buildings and the modern buildings, and the the roofs they put in they are mostly the royal royal style roofs. The Yingshan roofs are in traditional Chinese architecture, and in Japan they have a similar style called、uh, what was that called the Di Guan Yang Shi. It means The emperor's head. So,、uh, in Japan, they they have this similar style, but they were putting the Japanese style roofings on top of the、uh, westernized base. So the Japanese roofs they are larger and they have wider eaves. But in China, they change they just change it to the Chinese style roofs. <laughs> so,、nice. yeah, that was、uh, quite interesting. Um, architectural history that、mm. is criticized a lot and is not lasted to to the current trends, but just a specific、mm. uh, style at the time. 
Yeah, actually, I've seen similar things to that in contemporary China in Inner Mongolia, where oh. you have very kind of typical Chinese architecture that you would see anywhere else in the country, but then you have some elements that I can add it on top, or you know, like a, <laughs> like a roof, or yeah, so something also kind of it's kind yeah. of a similar similar process, I guess, trying to to bring kind of a, a local element. Yeah, yeah, I think modern, especially. Modern Especially at at that time when the new architects they all come back with a Western background, they studied in Europe, in the UK and US, and then they come back to Japan and China and they start to build the new cities, and there were quite a mixture and confusions in how to do the Eastern architecture, as ways. We say in our uh, architectural histories that there, the architectural education is, is just for the Westerns, and the, in the Eastern world there is no art architectural education, like in general in the syllabus and in universities, they are taught from the masters to their apprentices, so it's person to person and passing on. The, the knowledge of construction, but uh, it's completely different when these uh, these people come to uh, the U.S. and learn the whole syllabus of architecture from uh, classical drawings towards uh, the design part. And when they come back, they were thinking: Should we keep the Eastern? style buildings or the traditional buildings or should we try the new technical elements and the things we learn from the western world and the common trend in the beginning of the 20th century is that people tend to westernize a lot because there's a trend of advancement and uh, the power of western world overwhelm the traditional values and aesthetics back in the, the eastern part. So I think most of the buildings uh, in Japan and some buildings in China have these combinations of east, east and west, west built by the people, the architects come back from the western background. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, related to that, you said that the architecture of Manchukuo was criticized by some Japanese architects. Yeah. Uh, why, why, why were they criticizing it? Do you know? Uh, I was, have read several quite fun comments, uh, but I forgot who was the, the name of the Japanese architect. And he said uh, the, architect, the Japanese architects working in Manchukuo are the ones can't get any projects built in Japan. <laughs> so they, okay. they don't have working opportunities in Japan. So they go to Machuko and have these mm -hmm. uh, enormous building uh, opportunities and lots of mm -hmm. projects coming along. <laughs> so it, it's kind of a sarcasm towards mm -hmm. uh, those people. <laughs> and yeah, okay, there, there was, yeah, there was even a uh, architects uh, who was building in Manchukuo refused to uh, build the Xingya style building. And uh, I forgot his name again, but he was the architect for the central bank in Manchukuo. And when designing the bank, he said, uh, I will just build uh, a new classical style building purely without adding any uh, uh, different elements into that mm -hmm. to to keep uh, keep it as as it is. Otherwise, uh, when later people seeing the architecture, uh, they will criticize me and say it's a, it's a mess um, of mi mix mixtures. So mm -hmm. that's what some of the architects thinks when they are facing the the Xingya style and the. <laughs> the identity of Machugo in architecture. Um, we don't have a lot more questions. I just wanted to see if you wanted to tell us a little bit more about your 
your res I mean your your interest in that 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 historical time and and the re I mean the region as you said that's where you're from, but I, I'm wondering what brought you to that. What what got you interested in this in this topic? Yeah, well, I'm actually not a pure regional researcher, and uh, but the interest come from my uh, masters uh, while I was doing my masters in Cambridge. I was doing a project uh, on Northeast China again, but in a modern period, is doing the mm -hmm. uh, the economic and industrial reform, and there were quite a, a lot of films addressing that part. So I was interested in the uh, that part of history. Um, it's just the recent two to three decades, and. Mm -hmm. There, were, there was an industrial culture in the Northeast China. And then when I was finding these uh, histories, I, was, I just saw quite a lot of different cultural elements in those fil industrial films uh, that addressed some culture from Russia and some from the Japanese. And the roots, uh, it roots back to the very beginning of the modernization of Manchuria. So I'm thinking to move to the previous state of Manchuria when I decided to do the PhD. So, so I'm moving to the very beginning of the modernization in that region and to see how the, the mixture of cultures uh, come from, where is its origins come from. Yeah, I think that's uh, my intentions behind this research. Yeah, and also I, I was, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. I'm curious about my own hometown. I have left uh, left the analysis China for about fifty years, fifteen years. So half of my life I stayed outside my uh, hometown, and it's uh, quite. Uh, different feeling when you uh, come out and you look back your homeland mm -hmm. as as an outsider actually because uh, you are no more uh, an insider in the society but you're looking mm -hmm. at your homeland always uh, with a stranger's eye so I think mm -hmm. that somehow helps me to dig into the topic a bit yeah, right. yeah absolutely <laughs> Well, that's that was really a fascinating talk, and I, I can't wait to read more about your you know, read your work. And so, thank you for joining us, and thank you for talking about your research with us. Uh, and and I, yeah, thank you, thank you very much, thank you everybody. Yeah, thank for you, Frank. Uh,